In the year 2000, the Nature Conservancy and a biological data repository organization called NatureServe produced a report called Precious Heritage, the Status of Biodiversity in the United States. Authored by Bruce Stein, Lynn Kuttner, and Jonathan Adams, Precious Heritage was a comparative census of the over 200,000 eukaryotic species known to be native to the United States. The main message of the report was that in spite of the U.S.'s exceptional levels of biodiversity, many organisms are coming under threat of extinction. Precious Heritage was followed two years later in 2002 by a similar report called States of the Union, Ranking America's Biodiversity. Referred to as the Stein Report, this record parsed quantitative information from Precious Heritage into a set of state-level rankings. The findings of the Stein Report were somewhat surprising. The Yellowhammer State ranked fourth in overall diversity. Alabama also ranked highly in terms of loss of biodiversity. Alabama is neither an island like Hawaii nor a particularly large state like California or Texas. Even back as far as Charles Darwin, biologists have understood that islands and other areas that become geographically isolated over long periods of time tend to develop high levels of biodiversity. Biodiversity tends to vary with latitude, and specifically it increases with decreasing latitude. States like California, which span nearly 10 degrees of latitude, will also exhibit high levels of biodiversity. It is well known and an axiomatic fact that everything in Texas is big, including it would seem numbers of native species. Unlike Texas and California, which rank second and third in terms of total land area, Alabama ranks 30th in terms of total land area. So why does Alabama rank so highly in terms of biodiversity? R. Scott Duncan is a professor at Birmingham Southern College and the author of the book Southern Wonder, Alabama's Surprising Biodiversity. Dr. Duncan joined us via Zoom to explain why Alabama ranks so highly in biodiversity. Yeah, so there's there's four different factors. Um, the the fastest one to um, disperse with here is or dispense with here is is the political. Um, back when the Mississippi Territory, which was a combination of Alabama and Mississippi, were um, became part of the of the United States, um, that spanned five degrees of latitude from the coast all the way up to uh, the Tennessee Valley. And um, that was a lot of land, and it covered a lot of territory that has a lot of species in it. And that's a major reason. Another reason, of course, is climate. Um, Alabama gets lots of sunlight, lots of heat with that sunlight, and of course, lots of water. So all of this is governed by our climate factors. We are in a lower latitudinal zone, so um, we have long growing seasons and a lot of intense sunlight that brings a lot of energy for photosynthesis. And we also, as folks that are familiar with the region know, we get a lot of rain. And basically that's a great combination. If you're a gardener, that's what you want, sunlight and rain. And that's what we have lots of here in the Southeast and Alabama in particular. The reason that Alabama is an anomaly has to do with the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the currents in the Gulf bring uh, hot tropical water um, through the Yucatan Straits, straight up through the Gulf of Mexico and land that water right on our doorstep um, just south of the coastline. And that's happening all year long. And so we get a lot of warm tropical waters delivered to the state's doorstep. That means a lot of heat is delivered to the, um, to the continent um, as uh, winds bring that that air off the ocean, off the Gulf of Mexico and onto the continent, but it also brings, and more importantly, brings a lot of humidity. Uh, it's estimated that about 50% of all the rainfall in the Eastern United States is water that just recently evaporated off the Gulf of Mexico. And the other 50% is water that had come from the Gulf of Mexico sometime before and is being recycled. So it's the Gulf of Mexico, which is the reason why Alabama and the Southeast have such a wet climate. 
another piece of the climate explanation for why Alabama has so many species is definitely involving fire. Um, fire is, most people think of fire as something that is foreign or alien or dangerous for natural ecosystems. And certainly it can be um, when we humans have um, messed around with the landscape such that fire can't behave in the ways that it has in the past. Um, in the Southeast, fire has played a role for a very long time because the Southeast gets so much lightning. And uh, those most lightning strikes do not cause fire. Um, but back in the day when the landscape was well connected, ecosystems were all integrated with one another, one lightning strike could start a fire in one place and then that fire would burn for days and days, sometimes months um, and spread over a, a large area. And as a consequence, um, much of the state of Alabama was in the surrounding states in the Southeast where any location was getting burned regularly. Um, some estimates are that like along the, the Gulf Coast that the fire return interval, interval is less than two years, about a year and a half on average. In places like where I live here in Birmingham, um, up in the mountains, it's estimated to be somewhere between seven and 10 years. We don't see those patterns anymore. This is based on the evidence that we have of how things were like before uh, we really started heavily manipulating the landscape. So fire plays a key role um, in all of this for sure. So climate, as we were talking about, is really important, but there's a lot of evidence that there's something else going on. And as you guys probably know, it's geology. Um, Alabama has a, a hybrid terrain of mountain landscapes, interior plateau, and coastal plain. Five physiographic regions collide here. And each one of those regions has um, different landscapes with different types of rocks and soils at the surface. And each of those rock types or soil types sustain different species of plants. And with different species of plants, you get different species of animals. So we have layers upon layers of diversity in the Alabama landscape. Um, there are places, for example, right here in Birmingham where on a 15 minute hike, we can be in completely different types of forest where there's the, this, the tree species turnover is nearly 100%. Um, and that's because of different bedrock types at the surface. Um, so when you, com when you combine, when you look at that beautiful map of Alabama's uh, geology and you see all those colors, um, you can also think of those colors representing different suites of ecosystems, each of which has their own unique signature in terms of combinations of species. So that's so far, we've got, we've got three factors we've talked about so far to explain why Alabama has so many species, political, climate and geology. The last one that sort of ties it all together is the state's evolutionary slash geologic history. We have a very rich evolutionary past that has favored a lot of species evolution. Um, there's also some more recent events that are really important. So for example, during the Pleistocene, when most of the species that are around today were already in existence, during the Pleistocene, Alabama was spared as well as the other states in the Southeast, we were spared from glaciation. Um, and our ecosystems did not survive in, in the way that they were before the Pleistocene. They changed, they morphed, but species were able to eke out some way of surviving. <clears throat> Forests, for example, retreated into um, more sheltered environments like river valleys and mountain coves and things like that. Um, you had an expansion of because it gets colder, it also gets drier. Um, and we had an expansion of prairie and also uh, savanna, which is of course prairie with, with um, scattering of trees. <clears throat> and so that's what was most of the Alabama landscape uh, back at that time. If we go back deeper in time, the most important reason for why Alabama has so many species to begin with, what explains where they all came from has to do with the Appalachian Mountains. Um, the Southern Appalachian Mountains fractured the Alabama landscape into uh, multiple discrete or semi-discrete large and very different watersheds. And each of these watersheds became something like an evolutionary factory that was cranking out uh, new freshwater aquatic species. 
And as a result of this, Alabama has over 300 species of freshwater fishes, uh, over 180 freshwater mussels, over 200 freshwater snail species, nearly 100 crayfish species, 175 dragonflies and damselfly species, um, over 30 species of non-marine freshwater turtles, and over 20 species of frogs. So it, these are, this is a lot of numbers, a lot to keep track of there. Um, so here's what you, all, all you have to remember, which is that for these groups of organisms, these freshwater animals, um, Alabama is the number one state in the US, not number five, but number one. There, there are many more stories that could be told about how uh, the geology has influenced um, the species that we have here in the state today. But uh, um, the Appalachian Mountains and the Pleistocene, I think, figure pretty prominently. Um, the, yeah, I love that. 30 species of turtles. Take, take back what I said about no animals. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I know. love the turtles. Yeah. <laughs> Are there some unique factors contributing to Alabama's mm -hmm. plant diversity? Yeah, so Alabama's plant uh, biodiversity is really pretty interesting. Um, we are number one in the US and a global hotspot for carnivorous plants. So be careful when you're out there in the woods. Um, carnivorous plants are like, a, especially on the coastal plain, um, are like in a lot of the wetlands that are down there. And there's many different species from pitcher plants to sundews. Um, to all sorts of crazy other plants that people that most folks have never heard of before. Um, I think I tallied up over 30 some odd carnivorous plant species in the state when I was doing the research for Southern Wonder. If you zoom out and look at all of Alabama's um, native plant diversity, we rank number ninth in the US, so not super high. Um, but when you look just at the Eastern United States, uh, we're ranked number three in the East. So we do pretty well in the East. One of the reasons is that Western states um, have a lot of island effects by their mountain ranges. So their mountain ranges function like islands and plant species over evolutionary time get isolated in mountain chains and then they diversify. And so you wind up having those, um, those mountainous regions in the, in the Western US sort of functioning like species factories, like our watersheds do here in the east, in, in the southeast. And so that's, that's why um, Alabama doesn't write, rank quite so highly in terms of, of the plants. But we still have a lot of bragging rights when it comes to, to plants, and that has everything to do with our geology. Um, because of variation in the physical landscape, we have 64 types of terrestrial ecosystems in Alabama. We have, um, th those include 25 different types of forests and woodlands. So these are ecosystems dominated by tree species. And we've got 11 types of wetlands in the state and seven different types of glades and prairies. So Alabama is very rich with different uh, ecosystems that are shaped by uh, the plants that are here. And, and in turn, they are shaped by the, directly by the geology. When I was doing my research for Southern Wonder, um, I kept circling back to one particular ecosystem that I actually, when I first moved to Alabama and started doing research, I did work in, and that was the um, Ketona Dolomite Glades. Um, and glades in general really helped me understand how the landscape in Alabama has changed over time. So you would get these weird situations where you'd have like a rare glade species that was just found in one glade area, nowhere else in the entire known universe. And then sometimes in other glades, you'd have a rare species that was found there and in several other glades, but those glades were separated by dozens to hundreds of miles. And that begs the question, how did that pattern come about? How could you have a little plant whose seeds do not get dispersed very far, wind up being in these little clusters that are hundreds of miles apart in, in, across the southeastern US. They obviously could not have evolved separately and, and become identical. Um, that just didn't make sense. And so something else was at play. And so that led me into understanding more about our geologic history and, and how uh, these glade environments, which do not have trees, 
and our prairie environments and our barren environments, which are sort of like 50% uh, grasses and 50% wildflowers, that's what barrens are, how they're all sort of related to another based on our um, geologic past. So to understand this a little bit more, you need to know that the plants that grow in these weird environments, um, they need lots of sunlight. They are really bad at competing with other plants. They're excellent, however, at surviving in really harsh conditions. And that has been their, their ticket to survival. Um, you leave a glade and go into the forest and it's dark and shady and those little plants could never survive in an environment like that. But out in these sunny rock outcrops, they're able to do just fine. And um, because Alabama and has so many different types of rocks exposed at the surface, we've got lots of different types of these glade environments. We have sandstone glades, we've got limestone glades, we've got granite glades, we've got the dolostone or dolomite glades. We've even got shell barrens down on the coastal plain where old fossilized shells are exposed at the surface and support um, rare plant communities. So all of this begs the question, where did all this come from? Where did these species come from? So um, earlier we were talking about during the Pleistocene, how conditions were colder and drier. And during those times, the forests were retreated. We think of forests as being the dominant ecosystem here in the Southeast. And there's some truth to that. However, during the Pleistocene, um, forests were in the minority in terms of their, um, their coverage over the landscape. What happened as we emerged out of the, the, the Pleistocene is that conditions started to become warmer and they got wetter um, because things are warming up, the hydrologic cycle speeds up, more rainfall and so forth. And that was what forests needed to expand. Um, and as the forest expanded, it started pushing these sun-loving plants that had been doing well um, during these times into those positions in the landscape where trees struggle to survive. Um, so that's one piece of the puzzle for explaining why you've got these rare glade and prairie species in these little outcrops um, throughout uh, Alabama and the rest of the southeast. But there was another factor that influences the terrain that we know in Alabama today, a factor that um, what became a new force on the landscape at the end of the Pleistocene. And that, of course, were humans. Um, uh, the first Americans arrived in the Southeast sometime between 15 and 30,000 years ago. The story's still being written on that. <clears throat> um, but by the end of the Pleistocene, uh, humans were everywhere in the Southeastern landscape. And Native Americans were actively managing the landscape. It wasn't, a, it wasn't the wilds where you know, a squirrel could cross from the Atlantic coast all the way to the Mississippi River without touching the ground or anything like that. No, 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 no. The landscape was being actively managed. Um, the Mississippian Indian culture um, had cleared vast amounts of forest along our, um, uh, our floodplains for maize agriculture. In the, in the upper woodlands, um, trees were selectively uh, felled to favor those trees that provided the hard mast that the Native Americans survived on during the winter. So the, the acorns and the hickory nuts and the chestnuts and so forth. So the, all, all that to say that the landscape was under very active management. And one of the most important tools for Native Americans was fire. Fires were used to um, to uh, provide better hunting grounds because um, the fresh plants that, that grow up after a fire attract the wildlife that they would hunt. Um, the fire was used for defense. Um, you don't want a lot of uh, brush around your village where your enemies can sneak up on you. Um, fires were used to clear land for agriculture. Um, so all, all that and more was the reasons why you know, fire was a tool. And so, Fires, of course, can be difficult con to control and they would burn through the landscape. And as a consequence, those, those plants that love all that sun, the grasses and the wildflowers that had done so well during the Pleistocene, they were able to stick it out pretty well as the Pleistocene came to an end because of the presence of fire on the landscape. 
Of course, all that changed um, during and after the Native American genocide in the Eastern US. Um, fire was used by the first European settlers and the, some of the early uh, Americans, um, they were used fire to, to manage the landscape for mostly for grazing, but very quickly that was, um, that became out of favor. And as a consequence, the Eastern forests uh, sort of um, expanded from their strongholds and the landscape that um, <clears throat> within probably, yeah, easily within a, a, a century of um, Jamestown around 1610, 1609, uh, 1610, when we had the first English settlement, within a century of there, um, the Eastern landscape was closed up with forest. And that became the cultural, the cultural memory of what the landscape was like, which is of course a fallacy. The original landscape was so much different than it is today, than, than we think of it today. So a combination of geology and of course, human intervention dating back thousands of years is why we have the species still around today that are surviving on these rock outcrops and so forth. Okay, great. How are you doing there? 